Please take a seat um, as quickly as possible, please. Take a seat. We are running late and I don't want to start too late, please. Good evening to the candidates and good evening to the press as well. Thank you very much to everybody for turning up today. I'm sure this is going to be one of many Bradford West hustings in the coming days, weeks. Um, and uh, obviously today is your opportunity to ask your candidates the questions that you have in relation to the upcoming general elections and what they're going to do for you, for your city, for your community. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Fatima, Fatima Patel. I'm the editor of the Asian Sunday newspaper, a local Asian Sunday newspaper. Myself and uh, Ratna Lachman, director of Just West Yorkshire, have uh, together collaborated to put this event together for you. And uh, we're very grateful to all the candidates uh, for being here today. Thank you, Fatima. It's brilliant to see so many of you out here today. Uh, I think when we first started uh, asking people whether they wanted Bradford Hastings, there was, yes, maybe, maybe not. But I'm really pleased that we've had it because it shows that there is tremendous interest in what's happening in Bradford West. And we think that democracy is something that people should be exercising on the basis of issues. And that's what we're doing today. We hope that this is an opportunity for you to put kind of what you think and you you, what you thought about when you walked in aside and give all candidates actually an opportunity to express you know their views on certain issues. I'm going to be very honest today there is a lot of emotional investment in terms of the outcome for Bradford West. There has been a lot of press and media attention in terms of what's happening in Bradford West and I understand that different political parties have a lot invested in what is happening today. And that is good, because that means that you are invested in democracy. But I also think it's important that what we do today is that we keep the emotion aside and we constructively, constructively participate in the issues. Um, now, this is the note to our prospective parliamentary candidates. I've addressed the audience. Now I'll address the prospective parliamentary candidates. We've asked each of the PPC to provide an opening statement of three minutes, and I'll be timing this very strictly. I'll give you 30 seconds before your three minutes is due, and then you will stop. With that, really, I think we are almost kind of 10 minutes to six. I'll start the proceedings for today. I am going to ask uh, the PPCs to uh, give their three-minute statement, and what we will do is we'll go. We'll start with Mr. Harry Booter. Harry, would you start off, please? Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. I think a lot of you are thinking that who is this Harry? Uh, and when I say to you that I am Bradfordian, you will say, well, how? Um, for the next two or three minutes, I want to tell you exactly who I am and where I came from. I was, I came to Bradford in 1967 as an 11-year-old with my father, and I settled in Thornbury. I educated myself uh, here in Bradford, went to Fairfax Grammar School, and uh, in 1973, I joined the Royal Navy. So prior to joining the Royal Navy in 1973, I was Mohammed Bouta, and the Harry bit came, having joined the Navy, they all liked to have a, a nickname for something. They tried the Mo, the Mong, and everything else that went with it, and then somebody said, Harry, and here I am. So that's where Harry Bukta comes from. Uh, my journeys have taken me around the world, and also I, I was in the 1982 Falklands War as well, so I'm a veteran of the Falklands War and the Gulf Wars. I've settled down south for the last 20 years, and uh, been a member of... United Kingdom Independence Party for the last two years, which I have really, really connected with. It is uh, a party that I wholeheartedly believe in and believe in the policies. You will hear around me, I've been around Bradford, and the first thing I 
hear about the UKIP is the first word anybody says is racist. And I would like to make it clear to everybody here, if this party was the slightest bit racist, I would not be a member of it. So let's get this straight first. There are, there are, there are racists. You, will, you, will, you may laugh, you may laugh, but let's hear me out. Hear me out. Uh, you, you will find that there are more racists in the other parties, but they are muffled racists. Right? We have the odd one that puts his head up above the parapet and says, I'm a racist, and we say, well, thank you very much for letting us know. Off you go. Okay? So we, in... In, 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 in relation to the other party, are <laughs> the, the least racist of all. Okay, so I want to. I want to uh, well, well, if you don't believe, me, uh, you, you, you you will. Thirty seconds. Uh, <laughs> and I will. Twenty now. I will make you next the next four weeks. Uh, come and talk to me. Let's talk about it and, and let's clear this air and have a, a political party that means Britain for British people, for us, for our children, that's, that's me, right? Now I'm going to fight for it, for, for you, for us in Bradford to achieve what, we, what our aim is, which is you know, good education and, and, and good health service here. I will fight for you. Three and three I, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good evening, everybody. I was going to talk about our absentee MP, but he's here. I don't remember, it's election time! Okay, Bradford deserves better. I believe Bradford West needs a Labour government and a Labour MP. Let's be clear about a few things for Bradford West. This government has been a complete disaster for the school kids in Bradford. They have taken the money out of where we needed it the most, and spent it on free schools. Not only that, it is also worth pointing out that Labour did in fact put forward a motion for an alteration of school funding so that we could target the funds where we needed them the most. But our absentee MP wasn't there to cast his vote on that one. For children and families, we need a Labour government because we are committed to increasing childcare from 15 to 25 hours. Capping class sizes for five, six and seven year olds. Abolishing the preschool status. Bradford deserves better. We need a Labour government for families because under the coalition every family is worse off by approximately £1,100. We are committed to increasing the minimum wage over the next term of Parliament to £8. Freezing energy bills and we will be doubling paternity leave. We need a Labour government because the average weekly take-home pay in Bradford is approximately £360. In comparison to anywhere else where it's over £500 a week, Bradford deserves better. We have a coalition government which has failed miserably in reducing the deficit as promised. I can tell you, if this was a football match, my three-year-old would hit the back of that net better than the coalition government. The only table Bradford West has gone up in since the coalition is the unemployment table. What we will do if we come into power, the Labour government will put £9 billion through the LEPs, through the, through the LEPs, to actually devolve what we have at central government. And that, nine, that £6 billion will actually come so we can make the decisions of where we need to invest it the most. So nobody in London is telling us what we, how we need to grow our community, our businesses. 99% of businesses are small businesses. We will, for every one corporation tax cut that the Tories are offering, 17 small businesses will flourish. That's where we need to put our investment, in our communities, to create growth. Over the last three years, Bradford West has been badly served. We have an absentee MP, and for me, the role of the MP in Bradford West is about being our voice in Parliament. But he's never there, as he's too busy earning lords elsewhere. You're streaming into love. Thank you. She punctured her lung. By God's grace, she survived. The doctors who treated her there did the best they could, but the hospital in which she was treated told quite a different story. There was no soap. My parents who went there had to buy soap at this hospital. 
There was no drinking water. They had to buy bottled water. The sheets were dirty. They hadn't been changed. What was happening was a health service in a state of slow motion implosion. Because the Greek economy was in a state of slow motion implosion. There are many parties that will tell you they are the guardians of the NHS, but I will tell you the party that is the guardian of the NHS. It is the party that is the guardian of the economy. Because without a strong economy, be under no illusions, you have no world-class health service, you have no education system worthy of the name, you have no social services. Now I think we have a positive story to tell on the economy over the past five years. We've created more jobs in this country than in the rest of Europe put together. Here in Yorkshire, more jobs than in all of France. And contrary to Naz's claim, in Bradford, unemployment has fallen by 30% in the past 12 months alone. But it is undeniable that we are starting from a painfully low base. <coughs> unemployment in this city of Bradford West stands at almost three times the national average. The number of business units as a proportion of the population is barely half the national average. And worst of all, the number of people eligible who are claiming working or child tax credits stands at 63.5% uh, of the population, far above any other constituency in this country. So it is quite clear to me that something is going very, very wrong with local management somewhere. Now I want to talk about some of the positive things we can do to address this later this evening, and indeed some of the things we are doing. But finally, before I close, I do want to turn on to one other issue which is this point of community relations. If I were elected in May, 30 seconds. and I could make a positive contribution to trust, respect, and understanding between our communities, I think I could look back on my life and say I had achieved something positive. We have a problem with extremism, and nobody can deny it. But I can't help but feeling that at the root of it all is a sense of disenfranchisement and powerlessness. This constant demonisation in the press, casual racism, Your three minutes are up, thank you. And that I want to bring an end to. It is something that I will focus on uh, more than any other. Thank, thank you. you <laughs> well, those personal attacks on you... Attacks on me, Ms. Shah, cannot possibly be true, can they? Because on the 22nd of February at 1 p.m., you called us and asked us if you could be the respect candidate. In and before you make a bigger fool of yourself, I really advise you not to deny it. 22nd of February was the day after you came bottom of the poll with just 13 votes out of almost 220 in the Bradford West Labour Party selection. You are a big loser then and the kind of way that you have embarked upon this campaign has already ensured you're going to be a big loser again. You have only a passing acquaintance with the truth. You claimed, and gullible journalists believed you, that you were subject to a forced marriage at the age of 15. But you were not 15. You were 16 and a half. I have your nikah. I have your nikah. Mr. Galloway, can we please stick to the issues because you've made your point, you've made those two issues, can we now move on to issues, please? You, you, allowed, you, allowed, you allowed three 
personal attacks on me by my new Labour opponent. Mr. Galloway, I was going to come back to that. Mr. Galloway, I was, I was going to come back to that. Can I please ask emotions to just come down for a while? And I think, Mr. Galloway, will you continue, please? I will continue. No one will ever stop me from speaking. The issue is that my opponent is a liar. She lied about me. She lied about her age. She slandered this community for her own selfish ends. She played into every stereotype. Every stereotype. 15 seconds before you finish. Well, you, are you sure? Have you given me injury time for your interruptions? All right. No, no, it is actually. 3.10 now. I'm giving you another 20 seconds. Can we please? I need to keep I I have set politics alight in Bradford. That's why the media are here. We turned Bradford politics upside down. We've shaken the complacency of Labour, which is why they hate us so much. They have betrayed the people here in Bradford and elsewhere in the country. We are the real Labour Party, and that's why they hate us. I would like to remind all PPCs, please, that we are here to discuss issues. There will be things that are personal that have come up as long as they pertain to Bradford West. And that's why we're opposed to the privatisation and commercialisation of schools, colleges and universities. We will scrap university tuition fees and bring back the EMA for 16 to 17 years. We believe that public transport should be run in the interest of passengers. That reduce our carbon emissions and provide fairly, fairly priced services, helping people to use their cars less, providing more sustainable transport, like cycling and walking. Many years of underinvestment in housing has resulted in a housing crisis that blights the lives of many. We will invest in new social housing developments with zero carbon standards. 30 seconds. And bring empty homes back into use to ensure everyone has access to houses. The things that you want to ask, the questions you want to ask, rather than what I just want to say. I will beg the chair's indulgence to be a little person for a moment to just tell you who I am. I'm a general practitioner who's lived and worked in Bradford West for the last 30, nearly 31 years now. And it's a privilege to be able to stand as a parliamentary candidate in Bradford West. It has been a difficult few years, there's absolutely no doubt about it. We've had a very deep and difficult recession, but at last things are starting to turn around. Employment is rising, unemployment is falling. Uh, people are starting to see the benefits. Uh, households are starting to become be better off and we want to continue uh, that. We want to continue, we have a strong economy, because as has been pointed out, that's a strong economy, you don't want, you can't do the things you want to do, but it has to be in a fair society. You can't run a strong economy on the basis of the poorest suffering most, and we want to have fairness, we want to continue the work we've done with bringing people, lower paid people out of tax. So I'll stop at this point, so we've got more time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. that you've approached the Respect Party to join them as a Respect candidate. Could you actually clarify if this was the case? I will absolutely clarify. Could Mr Galloway also confirm, five minutes after oh, I left the property, could he confirm yes. that I actually said to the guy that I've actually just made a joke, could he confirm that please? Oh. Could he please? Could he also you, confirm? I no. don't want anyone. I joked about it, right? Now, please, I've got a whole WhatsApp conversation to no, prove no, no, it. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the person beyond there. So. Could Mr. Galloway also confirm whether or not, in terms of my lies, whether or not somebody, after going through two weeks of evidence, did, when they went, somebody went to Pakistan, did somebody pause as my father, who died over 12 years ago? to get my Nikan Nama from the office. Could he also confirm whether he has sight of the original one, which I have left in my office, which is dated the 20, 25th of December 1988? 
Of course not, because he doesn't have sight of it. Because it was my marriage, not his. Okay, Mr. Galloway, there are two points that uh, Nas has raised. That she said, A, it was a joke. And secondly, that, you know, uh, somebody went there pretending to be her father. Could you address those questions, please? And I... No, 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 no. Hang on. My dad, look. I've got the proof. If I will ask you to leave, I will ask you to leave. All right? I have asked a question. I, we are having one panel discussion here. You will get the opportunity in the last 15 minutes to put your uh, hands up and ask the question. So, Mr. Galloway, will you please address those two issues, please? I think you can take that from Naj as an admission yeah. that she called us not once, but twice, to ask if she could be the respect candidate in Bradford East the day after she came bottom of the poll in the Labour selection for Bradford West. She may claim it was a joke. She didn't say it was a joke. And I warn her not to go further down the route of denial. I haven't been in Pakistan for a very long time. I did not myself procure this nikah, but she's just told us she has an earlier nikah, but she left it in her office. Well, here I ask, let her produce the nikah from her office, because if she... She's either the only... What has my nikah got to do with Bradford West? Because you're a liar. a free-for-all, or are we going to be adults in this? Yeah. Naz, you raised an issue. Hang on, I will come to you. I sought a clarification. You will have the right to respond. And after Naz has the right to respond, we will go on to the debate proper. I'm not taking any more questions, because this is about Bradford voters, and there are loads of issues that people want to address. So... <clears throat> With, re with respect, Ratna, you should have stopped Nasha when she began her personal attacks. Would you please answer the question? Thank you. Well, I'm not sure what question there is for All me right. to have answer. You, have you said enough? No. Nas asks what this has to do with Bradford West. It has this to do with Bradford West. There are enough liars in the House of Commons already without electing another liar in the House of Commons. Thank That's you. the point. I will give you the last right of reply, and I expect us to actually observe decorum. We are not going to be shouting and screaming at each other over the chair. I will not allow it. So, a short response to what Mr. Galloway just said. Unlike Mr. Galloway, I am not going to go down the route whilst I've got an election campaign to run. I'm suing Mr. Galloway. I'll do that after the election. And I will be doing that. So, as far as I'm concerned, Fine. I have not, I refute entirely that I have lied about the age. We will now go to the debate proper. And I'd like to start with uh, the first question. And the first question is from Amin. Amin, will you stand up, please, and ask your first question? Uh, my question is all, uh, to all the panels. Has the dominance of blabbery of clan politics led to the corruption of local democracy? And if so, how? Can I start with you, Alan? There's no surprise, I think, in people wanting to group together. <laughs> exactly what we say. It becomes about personalities and not about issues. And it's very difficult when, when the, the, uh, the decisions about support and about groupings are made on the basis of personalities. And, and so, so it, it, it becomes difficult. And my gut feeling as somebody looking from outside is that... It does bring politics down. Uh, the rather system. I think having something that that should be left behind transported here to the UK. Having something that that should be left behind transported here to the UK. I think it's a bad idea to 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 use the system as it's been used. Let's bring politics back. Have brotherhoods, but please start using it 
in a sense where it's true democracy and not the democracy that we import, if you like. The campaign that has been run in Bradford West will be inclusive of everybody, regardless of race, gender and ethnicity, and it will bring about the real change that is needed in Bradford West. I think when Biradri uh, first came about in the, the 1960s and 70s, when people first came to these shores, I can entirely understand why it existed. People not speaking the language properly, uh, maybe not being able to read that well, not knowing how to fill in forms and so on and so forth. To have people who were able to help in that sense uh, was clearly something that was worthwhile. And so this concept of the community leader is born. My concern, and I think it's borne out by some of the things that have happened in this constituency in the past few weeks, is that since that time it has metamorphosed into a vast system of patronage, and often corrupt patronage. And the only thing I would say in terms of how we can get over this is each person in this constituency now has one vote. No matter how rich, no matter how poor, you have your own vote. And the Baradri can only work if the block stays together. But if each of the little bricks that make up that block make up their own mind based on the issues as they see them, then the system is by definition broken. So I would urge all people to cast their vote on that basis, based on who you think uh, can most uh, represent you and earn your trust, and not on the basis of what somebody else has told you to do. Thank you. All, all kinds of brotherhoods. Uh, George is a member of uh, the Toffs Brotherhood, the Bloomington uh, Brotherhood. He's a member of the Henry Jackson Society. That's another kind of brotherhood. There are all kinds. Well, I can assure you there's no libel in that. He's open about that. But uh, he's hoping not many people in Bradford West know who the Henry Jackson Society are. But they will, George. They will. There are all kinds of brotherhoods. Freemasons are a brotherhood. Uh, the Union of Catholic Mothers is a sisterhood. There's no reason to single out the Pakistanis, the Kashmiris, the Muslims, for special opprobrium about having brotherhoods. However, where that would be a mistake is amply demonstrated by what happened here three years ago in the by-election. Labour chose a candidate based on brotherly politics, and we gave them a bloody good hiding. And that proves, that proves that this problem does not exist to the same extent as some people claim that it does. However, if there's one place in the whole city where brotherism continues to dominate, it's inside the Bradford Labour Party. And that's the reason that Ed Miliband should come up here after the election, close down the Bradford Labour Party and start it again. Thank you. Young teenagers have gone to Syria from Dewsbury and today it's been claimed that over 500 women and young girls are joining ISIS. What would you do to prevent more young people going given that both prevent and the counter-terrorism policies have failed? George. Which George? Me? I'll call you Mr. Galloway. I'll call you George. Is that okay? If you want me to call you Mr. Grant, I will. Is George right? I'm, I'm very happy with Ida. I'm very happy with Ida. Thank you. Um, just a quick right of reply before we go any further on that. I don't know. No? On, okay. on prevent, please. Right. So, what is causing this uh, issue? I think foreign policy certainly plays its part. And I think anyone who denies that is foolish, but I don't think that that is the whole story. I don't know what anyone else says about me. This is why I'm standing in this constituency, to try and improve trust and respect between our communities. I think that if we can work towards uh, greater trust uh, between our communities and the police, that will certainly help in dealing with this issue. But most of all, there has to be greater trust amongst different communities themselves, be they white, black, brown or any other colour. In spite of the fact that our values on everything from our shared belief in the importance of family to the importance of education, 
enterprise, community itself are fundamentally the same. So that, I think, is where we have to focus our efforts, is in uh, promoting greater uh, respect between different communities and, and, and taking on uh, the bigotry and the racism that I think is making so many people so very angry. If you look at statistics of young people who go into, who, are, who leave the country, they're not people, they are generally speaking, they're not people who have been conditioned over years and years. These are people who have come into religion, either reverts, converts, whichever way you want to wrap it up, and they have found an anchor because they are, they are disillusioned. So what, what we need to be addressing is the root cause of that. We need to be supporting our young people to keep them, to, to, to get them involved in things, whether that's unemployment, whether that's um, the, the economic status that we're in, or a sense of belonging here. British children, British values, which uh, our cultural values are aligned to them. There is, you know, having, we have shared values and we need to focus in on them. Uh, and absolutely, in terms of the prevent agenda, um, it is an absolute toxic brand and we have committed to overhauling the, the uh, prevent agenda if we were to come back into power. Sorry, and now it's just, uh, at an earlier hustings that you were at, you know, and now I will come back to the others, you did say that you actually supported Prevent, uh, and it had been, you know, party to some of the money. Uh, so, are we detecting a change in position no, related no, to Prevent? No. I was very clear in that hustings, and there are people who are here who were at that hustings, that I delivered a project in 2009, where I was a director for a leadership development programme, in 2009, and their colleagues at Monsters who will clarify this and, and second me on this one, it was the first time Muslim communities were given targeted funding and lots of organisations, not just the local government Yorkshire and Humber where I work, delivered projects that were CLG funded, communities and local government funding. After 2009, Prevent went down the wrong route. It was absolutely the wrong route, and I do not endorse Prevent. I am very clear about that, but I did deliver a project which was one on leadership development of senior Muslim women. It was not a community grassroots intervention, which is what came in, and then we started trying to get people to start policing communities. That was wrong. Thank you. Mr. Gavin, can I ask you to respond to that? Well, there we go again. To the issue, please. Yeah, there we go again. The principal reason for radicalization, extremization, fanaticization was personified yesterday at the top of the Labour Party's election campaign and his name was Tony Blair. Tony Blair's invasion and occupation of Iraq is the most fantastic recruiting agent for extremism that anyone could possibly have imagined. The reason ISIS exists is because Labour's Prime Minister Tony Blair and George W. Bush invaded and occupied and destroyed Iraq. The reason why Al-Qaeda and ISIS are now on the outskirts of Damascus is because of Blair and Bush's invasion and destruction of Iraq. And George Grant, your Prime Minister, wanted us to become the air force of Al-Qaeda and ISIS in Syria and the House of Commons stopped them and one of the reasons why we did was because of my speech in Parliament before the vote which won by 13 votes to stop David Cameron doing it. You were in Libya, David Cameron and William Hague bombed Libya to smithereens and now Al-Qaeda are running riot and every kind of extremist organization with its own militia, its own army, has torn Libya to pieces. So we don't need any lectures from the Conservative Party or the Labour Party on this subject. I'll tell you what I would do to stop radicalization of British Muslims. I'd stop invading and occupying Muslim countries and I'd stop stoking Islamophobia here at home. The only point I wanted to make, the only point I wanted to make is just to be, it's a little bit more complicated than just talk about disenfranchisement. One thing I noticed recently, a significant number of the people who want to join ISIS are medical students. Now, I have to say, medical students aren't that disenfranchised. You know, the people who've got the opportunity to go into a, a pretty well-paid and pretty high-status profession, it's got to be a little bit more complicated than that, hasn't it? Um, I'm glad myself agreed with 
agree with George, we should not, we should not be rampaging around <coughs> the, uh, invading countries and, and making the situation worse. The Green Party is part of peace. It's about negotiation. It's about getting communities to understand each other, whether they're in Bradford, West or on the other side of the world. One thing that I'd like to understand is why these young people feel it's necessary to board a plane and take themselves to a war zone. What are they hoping to change? And we need to get to the bottom of the people who are sending out these messages that are making our young people feel that the only choice they've got is to board a plane and cross a into a country illegally. Um, as Alan says, it's a very complicated situation. Medical students don't need to do that kind of thing. But I think we need to be looking carefully. As a mother, I would be absolutely appalled to find my children on the other side of the world entering a war zone. I'm sure lots of you would. Um, that's my point. Thank you. Harry. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, Jane. First of all, I'd like to take issue with the word prevent itself and the people that it is targeted at. Uh, it's a divisive word, and I, I, I've never ever liked what prevent is and what it's trying to do. And I've often spoken with uh, the police commissioners with regard to this word, and I, it would have been engaged, would have been a lot better as a word of choice if it was to have been used. Now, if you adopt the UKIP policy of non intervention in foreign wars, uh, we would not need divisive things like this to start with, okay? And uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of the problems I think we have is education and the division between the second, third and fourth generation and the first generation is causing, in my opinion, it's my opinion, is, is the problem that we need to address. And uh, if we can get that education gap closed, we will we will get rid of this uh, divisiveness against the Muslims. I think it, we just get out of foreign countries, foreign wars. We don't need them. We don't need to, have, especially in Muslim countries, it's always in Muslim countries, we've intervened. Let's stop it. Let's have non-interventionist uh, uh, policies. And that's what we uh, uh, are advocating as well. Thank you. I'm going to take two very quick responses from the audience. Is there anybody who wants to come back? Brother uh, West, constituent. Uh, I was also part of the Bradford West hostings 2012. Uh, Prevent has failed, we all know that. Channel 7 project has failed, and so has the central project. Miniature projects of Prevent, they've all failed. Uh, they target Muslims, stigmatise and stereotype us within our community, and it's part of one of the questions that I'd like to put to all the candidates is that why is it difficult to ask difficult questions such as prevent and extremism? It's not Muslims only. It, it happens in you know, all, all walks of life. I might come back to that later. This was a very quick response. Is there anybody else who wants to make a comment? Very quickly, please. How important is integrity for a parliamentarian? Uh, sorry, I'm not taking questions. I ask specifically around responses to prevent. So I'm going to move to the next one. Okay, uh, uh, the next question is from Sue Smith Beckley. Is she here? Yeah, can you ask your question, please? I'd like to ask the panel about the spousal immigration rules, uh, whereby a spouse is required to earn a salary of 18,600 in order to call their partner to the UK. Um, this has a significant impact on the people in Bradford who find it very difficult to earn that kind of wage. And I'd like to ask the panel, how is that fair when it's so much higher than the minimum UK wage? Well, yes, and it goes to the question of coalition. You don't get everything you want uh, when you've only got 50 MPs. Um, the, the obvious answer is, no, it's not fair. It is a nonsense that a city like Bradford, where the average wages are lower, it should be harder to bring your, bring your spouse in than in London, where the average wages are higher. I mean, how, how could that possibly be fair? So a, a crude line like a crude uh, cut-off point like that is a nonsense. It is unfair, remarkably unfair, given that our economy brings much lower wage levels than it would in the South East, for instance. So, yeah, we're scrapping it. It's gone. But George, there's a clear distinction between how your government treats those who are big investors and those who earn below the 18,600 threshold. How would you actually support this policy? I think 
prima facie, it does indeed seem uh, quite unfair. And I hope you'll respect me for my honesty in saying that this is certainly something that, if elected, I would want to look at. The only thing I will say is, clearly, we have a serious issue whilst you have completely unrestricted movement of people inside Europe. What that therefore means is that for those outside Europe, the rules are disproportionately harsh, in my view, because we're so because we can't control any of the movement inside the European Union, there is a, a disproportionate harshness on those outside. Clearly, this is something that has to be looked at and renegotiated. Um, I don't want to start sounding like Harry Booter, but um, <laughs> but. Um, I think there does need to be a renegotiation on this issue, and I think there does need to be a referendum on this issue. It's as simple as that. Sounds good. On European. I absolutely agree. It's absurd um, to have 18,600 when your minimum wage is just 13,000. We are committed to reviewing it. Um, the Labour government, um, uh, um, we when it was. It was the Tories that bought in the rule where an immigration officer could look at your, if a person wanted to come over and it was just for economical purposes, and economic purposes, they could refuse them on them grounds. And it was the government, Labour government that came in and abolished that. And similarly, we'll be looking at reviewing this as well. Harry, your government, oh, sorry, your party, your party has been very vocal on this issue. What a lovely Freudian slip, though. What a nightmare. We live in hope. Thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I've got a vote. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I can understand why the 18,600 came where it came from and what, what they tried to do, which is to bring a spouse over and they can support it. And that's the kind of level that you'll need. Now, I would work hard when elected, when elected in Bradford West, to get this, to get this ridiculous figure annulled and abolished. Um, minimum wage should be the criteria at all levels, and UKIP's policy on, on no uh, income tax on minimum wage uh, should give 100% of that person that's earning the minimum in their pockets. Now, what I think they're trying to do is to say that Look at the savings, look at the minimum wage, and then look at what the person's savings are. That should be the criteria whether they can support their spouse or not. Right? So the minimum wage should be the criteria for, uh, for bringing your spouse over, and they can look at their savings as a, a, an additional thing to say that whether they can support the spouse or not. That would be something I'd be looking at, rather than, rather than the 18,500, which is totally ridiculous. Mr. Gallagher. Have you asked Nigel Farage? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, something, I hope you'll forget. He will agree with me. He will agree with me. I better not start that he'll agree with you. There's something well, unnatural, Harry, uh, about a man like you standing for UKIP. It's like watching a bear dancing. It's just not <laughs> natural. And you see the Liberals uh, overtly and George Grant for the Conservatives covertly, uh, seek to fool you uh, by saying that they look at it, review it. It was them that introduced it. It is a racist policy. It doesn't apply to an Italian or a Polish person who can bring a wife or a husband to come and live here, but someone from the subcontinent cannot choose a bride or groom of their own choosing unless they can demonstrate on paper £18,600 earnings. Now that is not just racial discrimination, it's class discrimination. Discriminating against poor people and discriminating against Asian people. It is an abomination and it's a disgrace that Labour is committed only to reviewing this. Why don't they commit themselves to scrapping it? I certainly would. Sue, I wanted to ask you, are you happy with what you heard? I think it, it's nice to see that all the candidates are broadly in agreement that they will either review or scrap it. Although I would say to Mr. Booter, who mentioned 
taking into account savings and the minimum wage. It's very hard to save when you're on the minimum wage. No. Thank you. I think, I think you're trying to miss the point that... Quick, quick retort. That, trying to miss the point that what the, the, the policies, when it was made, uh, this is what they're trying to design, that, uh, it, but it, it, they've got it wrong. They've got it wrong like everything else, they get it wrong. Right, so Please. Nigel Farage has got that wrong. Thank you. Nigel Farage hasn't made it. Thank you. Nigel Farage has not made it 18,600. Yes. It is <laughs> on, right. my, on my right hand side. Right. Uh, we're only about a month away from the uh, elections. I don't know anything about your personal life, but I'd really love to hear about your priorities. And not only about your priorities, because uh, it's not just Bradford West, it's the whole of Bradford, because it's all in the same boat, really. But in Bradford West, I want to hear about your priorities now. I haven't heard about that in the media. Um, and not just about your priorities, but how you tend to tackle those. Now, before you answer that question, can I say that if you can stick to three priorities, please, or we might have an endless list. Thank you, Tazeem. Uh, my three priorities, the first one has to be education. Um, the reason education is because we're second from the bottom and we have a long way to go, long way to get bounced education standards up. How I do that in terms of education is we have had Professor Wood's report which landed on the 17th of March that was incorporated into, into um, a plan for Bradford to deliver on in terms of, so it has priorities on how I would implement that is scrutinise and be unlike our, pre, our current MP who doesn't engage with our leadership, who does not, who refuses to engage with the leadership on education because he feels that actually you're part of the problem so I'm not prepared to talk to you. If we do not sit at the table, if we do not actually engage in those discussions and hold people to account, we cannot shift the status quo. We are in Bradford, Bradford Council has agreed to implement all those recommendations and Professor Wood's recommendations came, he was the advisor, the academic advisor to the, Brad, to the London Challenge, so we will be doing that. So there's a culture of accountability that has to be created. There has to be, from, for me the second priority has to be in terms of jobs. If we do not engage, we have six billion coming to the left. If we have that six billion devolution, we have to again be engaged in those discussions. Only then can we prioritise where the money is going to be going. And we have to target small, medium businesses because that's where the real growth is, that's where sustainability will come from. If we, we miss that, we miss, we miss the whole generation again. Third, so we've got education, we've got unemployment, apprenticeships, having people, skill set. Skill set is absolutely important. We have lots of people in Bradford who are graduates who don't have jobs. So we've got, you, you, the university fees are going to come down, you've got 3,000 each. So we've got less debt. And that less debt is not just about students walking away with it, but actually when we, at the end of it, we have 261 billion in debt that the government will end up paying back. So why do that? Why not just knock the tuition fees down in the first instance? So being able to give show young people the opportunity to increase their skill set for my free. But I've got lots more, but anyway. Now, can I just ask you, I mean, you talked about education being important, but clearly, you know, as far as the local council is concerned, Labour is actually now in power. It's the Labour leadership, you know, that has got responsibility for the portfolio. And how is it that, you know, we've had generation after generation of poor performance, so I, I, it doesn't square, square up. That's what you're saying. Let me square that up for you. The Labour, Labour leadership, the education came back under Labour, Labour leadership in 2011, not before that. For 10 years it was handed out when it was under a Tory council to circle. So that 10 years of failure, that 10 years of privatisation through the back door, let's be clear, is where we are at with education. We do have pockets of good practice. We do. We need to learn from that pocket of good practice and improve. We have. We are on target for 2017, and I've, I've openly said this publicly on the radio That's and to, to people. It's not good enough for me because my kids are in this education system. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, <coughs> I'd like to turn to you. I mean, one of the things that's happened in Bradford is that we've seen a mushrooming of free schools. We've seen academies come up, and what that's done is taken away vital funding from state sector. In a place like Bradford West, you know, when you've got schools that are under the state sector, they're getting important monies being taken away from them. How would you justify a policy as somebody who's standing for a constituency like Bradford West? Well, I think that the free school agenda in this city has actually yielded some genuinely positive dividends. 
there is now just one school in a uh, secondary school in Bradford West that has been rated outstanding across all areas. It was founded in 2012. It is Dixon's Trinity Academy. So it is clearly not the case uh, that this is uh, something that is proving detrimental to education. That being said, I, I, I find it really extraordinary that we talk about this in a sort of zero-sum way. It is quite possible to have uh, investment in state education and also to allow parents and governors who want to do so, other groups, to establish a school if they so choose. Uh, that is what is happening and I, I see no contradiction in that. As I say, um, you know, there is another free school that I visited recently called One in a Million. It George, too is having some extraordinary results. George, so it does seem to be working in this constituency. There's a zero-sum education pot. That hasn't increased. And if a larger proportion of that actually goes to academies and goes to free schools and not state schools, it follows that the investment in state schools is far lower than it is with free schools and academies, which is actually a pet project with Michael Gove. Well, they are all state schools. They are, they're, none of, they're not private schools. They're all state schools. You just have different categories of school. And this, think, this system is starting to work. I think... <coughs> Bradford in educa when education in Bradford West has bumped along the bottom for a very, very long time. We are seeing now improvements, real improvements in education in this city. A lot of them are coming through these academies. And why uh, everyone is so keen to rubbish something that works, it, you know, is frankly beyond me. I think I'd like to maintain if that same money still goes to the state sector, then, you know, possibly they might not be bumping around. Money, but Mr. Money Galloway... Is not everything. Uh, well, no, Mr. Money Galloway. is not, not a solution to all the world's ills right now. We're not seeing improvements. We're going down the league. When I arrived here three years ago, we were the fifth bottom of the league. Now we're the second bottom of the league. And the Tories are going to cut education spending by three billion pounds in the next 12 months if they get back. You can't cut education by three billion pounds and expect better results. You don't need to be Einstein to work that out. But it's Labour that are running the schools in Bradford. There's no point in a Labour candidate saying that education is just not good enough here when it's her party that are running the schools. Now, when you're second bottom of the football league, the manager gets the sack if he doesn't have the grace to resign. But they never get the sack in Bradford. They never resign. The schools get worse and worse, and the same people keep on running them. And as for the 10 years of Serco, it was the Labour government that introduced Serco running schools. The government of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. So Labour are trussed up like a turkey in this. And I think nobody in this hall or in this electorate should be in any doubt. I mean, she talks about the London challenge. It was me that raised the London challenge. When they were telling us we didn't have a problem, I was demanding a London challenge. Now, it's wonderful to have converts. Let's have a London challenge here in Bradford. Mr. Let's hire the people who ran the London challenge to run a Bradford challenge. I was the MP runner in Tower Hamlets. They're 15th from the top of the National League. We are 152nd out of 154. If we can do it in Tower Hamlets with the same demographic as we have here in Bradford, we can do it too. Mr. Galloway, I've heard you talking about the Bradford Challenge, and you know, you've made it one of the key issues that you want to engage in. But what I haven't seen is progress in terms of moving that agenda forward. And I also recall that you raised this issue in Parliament, and you were invited by Mr. Michael Gove to meet with him to talk about, you know, how you might be able to work with him to try and rectify the situation in Bradford. So, could you kind of, you know, elucidate what you have done in terms of the Bradford Challenge, rather than saying that that's something we need to have? And did you meet Mr. Michael Gove? I did indeed, in his very plush uh, private office. And I said to him exactly what I've said to you and the audience, that Bradford schools are a national disgrace. 
and the people that are running them need to be sacked if we're going to make any progress. I had three conversations with Michael Gove on this subject when he was the Education Secretary, but the problem is he's ideologically bound, as is George Grant, to a model of free schools and academies which, as you implied, suck resources, suck money, suck teachers out of the state system where the vast majority of our students still have to go. Now, I don't run the city hall. I wish I did. I don't run the government. I wish I did. But I'm very glad that Labour in Bradford has at least come round to accepting that there is a problem. They want to call it the Northern Challenge. I call it the Bradford Challenge. I'll settle for a Yorkshire Challenge. Thank you. But let's do something, Thank for you. God's sake. Yeah. Could I ask both of you, would you like to stop that? I have two children who came through the Bradford education system, and they've done pretty well. There are pockets of excellence. I don't think we should blanket the whole city as having failing schools. We have young people who are not getting an education that is 21st century standard. We need to understand why that is. All children start similarly. They start, you know, as small people um, and they, they have opportunities presented to them throughout their lives. We need to start early. We need to be looking at preschool education. We need to be getting to understand how the young person's mind works so that they can develop to their, their potential. And Naz mentioned things like um, apprenticeships. Um, not everybody's academic, we know this. In the, in the Michael Gove world, everybody can be a, a, a PhD student. That's not possible. Um, apprenticeships are important for the kind of people who have practical skills. Um, we do have apprenticeship, apprenticeships in the city. They're not well publicised, that is part of the problem. Um, we do have opportunities for young people that somehow the schools don't give adequate career and you know, lifetime advice. There's a new Labour government that forced Bradford Council to take to outsource education to Serco in response to the uh, failures of the Labour administration that have been running education in the years leading up to that. However, we are actually talking about uh, a parliamentary election, we're talking about national government, and as has been quite pointed out, the main responsibility for delivering education is, is down to the council. George, money isn't everything, but it's bloody important. It's well known, it is well known, obviously, uh, all the research shows that what really makes a difference, what really brings this quality of education up is the quality of the leadership in the schools, and what we have to do most of all is to attract good leaders, good teachers, good head teachers into our schools. But money is important. Five years ago, I, said, I was asked what was my most important priority for the election of the Dem policy five years ago. And I said it was a pupil premium. It was a system which means that actually places which are economically deprived, which have historically suffered from lack of investment, schools in those areas where pupils are coming from economically deprived backgrounds would get more funding. The pupil premium has worked come through and as a result of that schools in Bradford have got more funding in line with the elements of deprivation the pupils they're dealing with. Unfortunately it still hasn't helped yet and that's more about the leadership so it has to be done. Thank you. Next question is from Nadeem Murch Oh sorry Harry, did I miss you? Sorry. <laughs> just keep none, reminding none of, me. None of them. <laughs> Cel Celia has just mentioned that uh, she has two children going through the Bradford education system. And uh, let me tell you that I went through that Bradford education system as well from the age of 12 to the age of 16. So four years of education I've had in Bradford schools. From, and that four years of education in the 60s and 70s has led me to sit here in front of you right now standing for a member of parliament. Now, that must have been some education system. Okay? Where, where, so why do you not look at, you can laugh, when, like, the laughter says something that there's no understanding going on, but I, I do respect, I do respect whatever you find funny. Like George said, things are on the decline. Just going back to your comment, Celia, about your two children doing well. In a certain school, if uh, the attainment and achievement levels are, let's say, 30% of ch children um, attaining grade A to C, I'm not interested in that. 
I'm interested in the 70% of the children that are failing. And that's what's happening in our schools. Why is something not being done about it? Something needs to be done about it, and soon. And practical things need to be put into place. Hi, George. Um, your record as a parliamentarian in the House of Parliament is actually quite poor. I did some research, and you only attended four debates last year. Well, David Ward, who actually um, lobbies on similar issues to you do, attended 42. You're also quite busy in terms of developing international relations, including potentially, and some might even say, developing a media career. Can I just ask you, looking back in hindsight and actually reviewing your term in office, do you think Bradford constituents deserve better? Well, Bradford uh, constituents chose me and they'll vote again on the 7th of May. Unfortunately, your research didn't quite go far enough. It's simply untrue that I attended four debates. I, I spoke 12 times in Parliament in the last week before we broke up. That's 12, 1, 2, 12 times in the final week uh, on the uh, London Transport Bill on the issue of privatisation. My speeches in Parliament are watched all over the world. So your research was, may I suggest YouTube? Because if you go to YouTube, you'll see speeches by me in Parliament that have been watched hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of times. I'm not sure that, the, uh, that my Labour opponent will ever be able to say that. I am one of the senior parliamentarians in this country. That's why the media are here. That's why all these people are here. That's why I believe I'll be re-elected on the 7th of May. Because people want a parliamentarian to represent them, not a community activist or a councillor, or in this case someone who has never been a councillor or even tried to be a councillor. I think people want a person with international relations. They're watching this contest from Manhattan to Gaza, from Mirpur to Baghdad, they're watching the result of this election all over the world, and you know it. And you also know who will be dancing in the streets where I to lose, and who will not be. So I stand before you as someone who is recognized as a parliamentarian of note, as an orator and parliamentary debater of note, and I'm putting myself at your disposal. Of course, if you want me to go, of course I'll go, and you'll be left with her for the next 25 years. I don't think so. You're going to be left with Harry. You're going to be left with Harry. If you effectively have a busy press and media life, given the issues that Bradford West has, isn't it right that you ought to be spending more time here in the constituency advocating for the needs of your constituents rather than, you know, kind of jetting about the world? I think that's no, no, what I don't jet about the world. That's just not true. I don't jet about the world. I'm on television from London talking about politics, about issues that affect every person in this room. That's where my media career is. Secondly, 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 if I may, I'm in Parliament every single day. What you're referring to is voting. I can't vote in most votes because the choice is between David Cameron's motion and Ed Miliband's amendment and I seldom agree with either David Cameron's motion or Ed Miliband's amendment. That's the reason why you're able to make these false accusations uh, this evening. Now, of course, um, Harry's in essential oils. I don't know what George is in. There could be people with business interests. I have no business interests. My business is politics. Political TV programs, political radio programs, political Thank books, you. and political journalism. And I think most of you have enjoyed them Thank over you. the years. I'm going to take...
three very quick comments to what you just heard George say. The guy in the blue in front here, you've been putting your hands up. George. Sorry, that was uh, louder than I expected it to be. <laughs> Hi, George. Um, if you remember me, I actually did your uh, campaign tune the last time you were standing in Bradford. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The person behind, please, and I'll come to the other two. Uh, my question is on the topic of education. No, it's, it's a very specific, right, your comment to what, uh, you know, the answer George gave. George, George Brandt, um, given what you've heard... No, what? To George Galloway. Okay, George. It was a response to the question, if you have nothing to say, I've you please sit down. Say. Thank you. <laughs> Could I ask you, please? Yeah. That was good. Just for everybody's information, George Galloway has attended over... 140 weekly surgeries, helping over 4,000 constituents since 2012. Sorry, and you are? Nasreen Khan. Sorry? Uh, Nasreen Khan. And are you with the party? Sorry? Are you with respect? I'm with respect, okay. yes. Can I finish, Ratna? Thank you. No, 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 I didn't, I didn't stop you. I just wanted to be very clear. Okay. Because I did ask him to introduce himself, so... You know, Sorry, it's very okay. specific. George's next final years will be securing future for the young city of Britain. Education, training and jobs. Proper jobs. Thank you. There's one person there. Um, could you stand up please? Voted for George Galloway in the last election. I campaigned for George Galloway in the last election. I'm not a member of respect. But I think he's being criticised by a number of people because he takes on board international issues. There was, in Victorian times, there was the expression, a little Englander. George Galloway is not a little Englander. He's concerned about what's happening in Palestine. He's concerned about what's happening in Iraq. He's concerned about what's happening in Syria and Libya. You cannot isolate those things from what we need in Bradford West. As far as I, I, I observe, uh, the lady mentioned all the different surgeries you have. You're a good MP, and I'm going to vote for you again. The point, I'm going to keep it down to a comment because it's been, we've been asked to keep it down to comments. People voted for you, and I voted for you because. You gave us a voice that we thought we didn't have. And you mentioned you talk about issues that do affect us and we do care about Palestine, Iraq, all those issues across the world. The issue is, and I think most people on both sides of the aisle will agree with me here, it feels as though and it seems as though you don't talk about Bradford West enough. Yeah. And you are a Bradford West MP. And I think that's what the I'm a big fan of yours, I have been your US Senate hearings especially. But that seems to be the more, biggest disappointment people seem to have. Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for being a big fan of mine. Uh, uh, you'll find it. Uh, you, you won't be surprised if I find it a little hard to believe. And there's a clack who clack that kind of talk. I am in Bradford every single weekend. I have a surgery every Saturday morning, which starts at 11 in the morning and goes on as long as it takes. <laughs> I have tabled 250 motions in front of Parliament, the great majority of them, that's in three years by the way, that's more than any other MP in the whole country by the way, that's more than all the motions tabled by the other Bradford MPs put together by the way. I have, I have a record, local, national and international. And of course, I make the point again, clearly you're not going to support me. I promise you, many thousands are going to. I'm going to win this election and win it big. The next question that we have is from uh, Mr. Amjad Parvez, who's a businessman. Can we please... Good evening. I would like him to be able to ask the question, please, because it is an important question for Bradford. Andrew, will you please stand up? How will our candidates create an ecosystem of education, health and enterprise, working through local, regional, national and international institutions? 
to ensure that every citizen is empowered and hence less dependent on the so-called effective leaders. Thank you. We have spoken a lot about education, so if you could just leave education for now. We will create regional banks which will then devolve the money and we will encourage lending to small businesses. I spoke to the Italian um, um, cafe that's opposite the road today at my office and he said to me he couldn't even raise £10,000 even though he'd been in business for absolute years. Now that's an absolute disgrace. If we want real growth we have to invest in 99% of the business community which is a small businesses in our communities. What I would do is actively lobby and scrutinise. It's not good enough just to have the policies. It has, we have to hold people to account. We have to, people who know me, I have taken on the regional government on issues. I am very, very issue led. If we do not hold people to account, if we do not engage at the table, we will not get a slice of that cake. If we have, if we create a creative toolkit for young people to get engaged and skill them up, we can then have young people that prosper. When young people prosper with skill sets, families prosper. When families prosper, communities prosper. Only then we have economic development which is actually sustainable on a long-term basis. So we have to engage with regional structures. We have to be, we have to shout louder. I agree with Celia totally. Bradford has been the little brother to the big brother of Leeds, not just Manchester and other cities. And it's about time we fly the flag higher, not just in Parliament, but within regional structures too. Before I hand it over to Harry, I think uh, Mohammed Iqbal has got a question that's aligned to what Amjad asked. Could you ask your question and then I'll invite uh, Harry Buzi to respond. I'm speechless at the moment, so don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was having a nightmare yesterday when I saw Tony Blair address the European question. But it is a question to do with Europe and um, it's relevant to Harry, but I'd be interested in another uh, um, participant's view. More than uh, 350,000 jobs in Yorkshire depend upon trade links with the European Union. Just 1% of Britain's business leaders support withdrawal from the European Union. Voting for UKIP will be economic suicide for Bradford businesses. Do you support withdrawal from the EU? Easy question for you. Easy. <laughs> Thank you. I said I was speechless, but now he's... He's, he's, he's giving my voice back, <laughs> talking about the EU. And the answer is, of course, yes. Uh, the recent studies have highlighted that we will prosper out of the EU. Uh, NAS has been saying about funding not being made available to people. If we're the out of the EU, we're paying £66 million every single day into the EU. We are paying billion pound per month to the foreign budget and we have got people living rough, we've got businesses struggling, we can't invest in our own economy in, in locally and, and, and nationally and we, we seem to borrow money, we seem to borrow money, all these uh, left, right, red, blue, etc. They borrow money to give away, it's our money, it's our money that we forget that they don't have, the government doesn't have any money it is all ours. So whatever they give away, whatever they make pledges abroad or with any other nation, it is your money, it is my money that they're giving away. And we allow them to do it. And we are struggling. When are we going to stop this? When are we going to wake up and say, look, stop. Let's invest in us first. Let's invest. Our, everything's underpinned by education. Whatever you do in life is underpinned by education. Let's improve our education systems. Let's plough wherever we need to divert funds from abroad into our education systems. Let's bring back the models that worked, grammar schools that worked. Then we can go into our enterprises because the people will be skilled and given the, the, the necessary grounding to be entrepreneurial like I am, which I am going to now design an oil is called Go Away no, Gallery. I'm not going to allow that. <laughs> no, Mr. Harry Buta, I will not allow it. It's, 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 you can talk about the enterprise, but you're not using it to advertise. No, I'm going to call stop. No. No, 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 no. no. If you have a referendum today, 77% of the, 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 the nation wants to come out of the EU. Rubbish. That's what will happen. No, no. Thank you. That's rubbish. <laughs> if you want to massage the figures, Harry's got a nice line in oils. That, uh... <laughs>
just about as massaged as it can get. 99% of the people in this room think that it would be absolutely insane to leave the, the European Union and how anybody can come for a lecture in West Yorkshire where hundreds of thousands of jobs depend on our trade with the European Union is simply being the trade ridiculous. Will, as you know, as a lot, the trade will still remain as well as well, we know that very well. well. We will Thank still you. be trading with our nation. I think, Mr. Booth, uh, the point is here. that, you know, we did take a straw poll. I know this might not be representative of Bradford West, but the consensus here is that at least this audience would prefer for us to stay in the EU. Yeah. I'd now like to go to Mitch, who has a question. Um, this is for Celia um, Hickson. Um, the Greens are the natural alternative for uh, the Liberal Democrats. Um, you, the Greens, are against the uh, HS2 uh, fracking and Jewish the seemingly environmentalist in nature. Uh, my question um, is the fact that the Lib Dems' recent manifesto priorities, uh, they committed the party to five green laws. Um, if yellow is the new green, why should uh, anyone vote green at all, as your party does not have a chance of being in the government? Um, what is the point of the Green Party? Well, we have many different policies from the Lib Dems. Um, we are just a to live. Uh, we're against the HS2, simply because we don't think that 20 minutes on the journey time is worth 62 billion pounds. And we should be connecting me from Manchester. It takes 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I was uh, looking forward to tuition fees to come up. Um, I'll let everybody into a secret. We didn't win the election. Last time we got 50 MPs, and we managed to get in about 75 percent of our manifesto, including some very important green measures that have taken place. So we didn't win. The party policy remains that we would like no tuition fees. However, we didn't get the opportunity to bring that forward. What we did do in negotiation, we could have sat on our hands and let the Conservative policy on tuition fees go through. Ask. Uh... That, yes. Well, how, how would you respond to him as a student? And just tell us uh, where, where you go to university, please. I, I go to Leeds Beckett University where I'm studying uh, international relations and, um, and peace studies. Um, I think clearly what the Lib Dems did, and it shows what they're doing now in this election, that they've been very quiet on these two issues, um, particularly the issue of um, you know, the fees, um, and of course the issue of detention of, um, of immigrants. Those are the two issues that they ran on um, last elections and they stirred up a lot of excitement, but they've been very quiet on those issues uh, this time around. And to me that demonstrates the, the, the hypocrisy um, you know, of the party, that clearly they're just more interested in, the, in, the, in, you know, in getting votes and so therefore they will do what it takes to win the elections. And they'll... Harry, we'll do one, a quick response from you and then I'd like to go to two other questions. I just, uh, I just want to tell you what the UK policy on, uh, on tuition fees is that we will abolish all tuition fees on science, technology, engineering, mathematics and medicine degrees, okay? So we are creating a two-tier tertiary education system. We're that would be we're start, policy. We're starting at that point where the STEM subjects will be, uh, there will be no tuition fees for those. Okay, I've got, I'm going to take two questions next, one from Anne-Marie and Kath. Disabled people are increasingly being required to contribute to the cost of disability services and care that were once free. They cannot afford this and are being denied the opportunity to participate fully in the community. What do you and or your party intend to do about this? Can I also ask Kath to ask her question? Where is Kath? I'd just like to ask, um, 
What will your party do to improve services for people with mental, dis uh, mental health problems? For example, MIND estimated 100 people a day with mental health problems are having their benefits sanctioned and many people in crisis are unable to access inpatient care in the district uh, where are aware of examples of people being sent to hospitals in London. Thank you for those two questions. I think for me uh, this is one of the most important issues uh, that we face. I came into politics because I believe in, as I've said, trying to improve things for people. I don't just say that, um, for the better. And that includes uh, the most vulnerable, of whom disabled people are clearly a large part of that. The spare room subsidy, bedroom tax, whatever you want to call it. I mentioned to you earlier uh, this point about uh, MPs not just being uh, followers of government policy. It is my view that anyone on disabilities should not be affected by that policy. And I very much support the amendment that was passing through the House of Commons before it was dissolved for the election uh, to make that uh, into law. I think one of the other things uh, that strikes me is reforming the welfare system so that it is less complex has to be a good thing. Because the number of complex, you know, when, when you look at it, the number of different payments and different schemes make it almost impossible to properly, for either an assessor or for the person who is on those uh, uh, benefits, to be able to make a proper judgment about what is and isn't required. So I think simplifying the system um, and continuing to invest in those services, you know, these are things that I, I fully support. A quick response to the issues around mental health. Yeah. Oh, right, sorry. So, I um, have signed the concordat of the mental health charity MIND. I think one of the things um, that they are doing is trying to integrate services and better integrate care. And this is definitely something that is a large part of the health reforms generally with NHS England is to try and improve integration of services so people aren't falling through the cracks. I mean, I know this is something... I'm afraid I really disagree with the Tories on this one because the bedroom tax was bought, and bought in under the Tories and it's affected disabled people the most disproportionately. So the first thing we would do is you remove bedroom tax. As a former disability rights advocate, what I will say, in addition to the abolition of the bedroom tax, what we are committed to is developing the work that's already undergoing improving the access to services and improve and put funding where it needs to be put so actually going out there in the communities rather than if you look at the concurrent model what it does is it brings community care into the community and it takes away from getting people into Linfield Mount for example and it brings care closer to home in a more emergency way in a more holistic way to respond to people in crisis I think that's the way forward and I actively support them we know that they know it, but they won't tell you until after the election. They are witch-hunting disabled people, witch-hunting unemployed people, witch-hunting minorities, witch-hunting anyone that can divert attention from the real culprits and the real problems in our country. Atos needs to be scrapped. The bedroom tax has to be scrapped. It took labour four years to come, four and a half years actually, to come to a decision that they were in favour of scrapping the bedroom tax. We were against it from the beginning. But my last point, because I know you're anxious, Ratna, is this. I, I hurt my ankle playing football in the back courts of Manningham two weeks ago and I limped a little as I came in to the meeting. No one here would stigmatise me because of that injury, yet too many people stigmatize those suffering from mental health problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. George, I just wanted to ask you one last question. We know that there are going to be 12 billion in welfare cuts, and the Tories have said that they're going to be 12 billion. Don't you think we deserve to know 
where those cuts are going to fall before the elections and not after. I think that parties need to be as clear as possible uh, where the cuts will come from. I can't say I am not the government. One thing I want to say, however, which has become increasingly clear as the evening has progressed, is how easy it is to wish for things. I can say now, on this platform, with no elected power, I want to see an end to world poverty. And it means nothing. The reason government, thank you, the reason government, the reason governments make difficult decisions, not all of which I agree with, is because we have a situation in this country where we are blowing a billion quid a week on the debt interest. What does that mean? We're spending more on the bloody interest than on our entire departmental Who budget gave us the debt? of defence. Who gave us the debt? Everyone. We had the banks were the lending money the like no tomorrow. I'll come back to you for Gordon a response. Gordon Brown was spending money like a drunken sailor on shore leave. You had people taking out mortgages they couldn't possibly afford. So my point is this. In unbelievably constrained economic circumstances, there are inevitably difficult decisions to be made. People have to make those difficult decisions because they don't ever actually have to take responsibility for a single thing. I just wanted to say that the wealth of the richest people in the country has doubled since 2010. We're not right. Thing to say really. So me as a disabled person has to pay for the, the misfortune of having bankers as we have, of having politicians as we had, because of having others who made decisions to take my money away because they were the people who knew. The gentleman with the hat, and that being the last comment. It, it sticks to me, George, that you've got a complete misunderstanding about all this works. Um, you are aware, aren't you, that the private banks actually lend this money to the population, uh, the corporate sector, the public sector, and so on. Do you want to stand up? Because I think people um, want to hear what you have to say. I don't think I've made voice say that louder. No, I think they'd like to know who you are, rather than a disembodied voice. Everyone thought from former council in the Labour Party, but not anymore. Um, <laughs> Do you know how the legal system works? I've got a question, pencil, for later. Might not come up. No, no, I, we're, we're finishing. This is the yeah. last comment, so please do make the comments. Do you know how the monetary system works? Do you know why people are in debt? Because I'm really worried about Tory prospective candidates. I'm worried about Tory MPs. And I'm really worried about George Osborne because he simply does not appear to understand. Yeah. 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 Right, thank you. Alan, can I invite you to give a two minute summary in terms of what you want to tell the audience based on what you've heard today? Could you go there, please? I'm, a, I'm an NHS general practitioner. I've been doing that for 30 years. And to be honest, if you put me on a rack and make me choose between being a GP and being a Liberal Democrat politician, I'd go for the, to being a GP. I want to say this about the NHS, because a lot of people will tell you different. Our NHS is not broken. People will say it's broken, it has to be changed, something has to be done. It is not broken. It is at least make it stand where it is and not get any worse. But there are people out there who will tell you things have got to change, we've got to work differently, we've got to bring in privatisation, we've got to use the markets because the NHS is broken. I'd just like to say that um, the things that have come out this evening for me have been around leadership, around how we get Bradford West to be trumpeted around, uh, in the north of England as a, as a place where people want to invest. A major priority in my by-election campaign. We won a landslide majority. The Odeon has been saved. The government has stumped up the money. And soon it will be another jewel in Bradford's crowd. No sooner had I got here three years ago, but George Grant's government and your government, sir, because both of you are strange bedfellows, no doubt, but bedfellows <laughs> nonetheless. Announced that you wanted to close the National Media Museum, Bradford's only national institution. Ed Vesey, the Culture Minister of the Conservative Government, congratulated me from the dispatch box 
for the campaign, he said, I had led, which saved the National Media Museum. Five more years, that's what I'm asking for. Thank you very much indeed. This has been an extraordinary evening. <laughs> In very many ways. This is an election where you need to have an MP who will actually be able to do something for you. And I will just say this by way of conclusion. Empowerment is what it's all about. And that starts with employment and jobs and the economy. I want us to just take a moment to be calm and think. Look around Europe Look around the world and look here at what we have achieved in the last five years. I think under the circumstances of extraordinary financial difficulties. Your two minutes are up. It is a record to be proud of. And I just urge Thank you, you to think again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. You've covered a lot of what I was going to say. These are the facts, sir. Naveen Murtaza asked some questions, and I'll elaborate on that research because I did go ahead and, and do some more research. Out of 733 votes, the only number of votes that were cast were 82. The city MP did not vote on the counter-terrorism bill. When there was a 1% increase of benefits being discussed in Parliament, our city MP was happy to be in Sudan, paid for by dictators talking about human rights abuses, but is not prepared to sit with the council in Bradford and talk about education. Sudan does not bring education achievements in Bradford, not in Bradford, West it doesn't. It does not bring jobs into Bradford. It does not bring jobs. Can you please give her the, the weight? This is not personal. This can is a this is a policy. We were talking about, talk about human rights, but not talk about education in Bradford. Oh, no, can you stick to the issues, I'm please? I'm so, I have set out very clearly, I, this is not personal. Personal attack is about talking about personal things. This is about what we elected a parliamentarian to do. And if that's the only thing, Thank <laughs> you. 
what, what Bradford needs is, is someone who's lived a life amongst everyone in, in the UK without sounding, um, you know, we, what Bradford needs is, is a unifying force, not somebody who's divided communities. I have lived amongst all everything, my children are uh, mixed race, and so I am a very qualified candidate to, to, to unite us, vote for me, vote for Harry, and let's have a new MP under the purple banner. Thank you very much. It just leaves me now to say, I know it's been a fraud debate, but this is democracy at its very best. And I think that, you know, for those of you who have cooperated, thank you very much. For those of you who haven't, you've made it exciting, certainly. What I would like to say is that on behalf of Asian Sunday and Just West Yorkshire, I'd like to thank you for coming. And I do urge all of you to vote on the 7th of May, because democracy is a precious thing. Please use your vote wisely and Godspeed.